Okay, well, welcome back. Our, our, the second method of the section is clustering, um, which refers to a, a broad set of techniques for finding subgroups or, or clusters in data. So we're trying to segment or, or, or partition the, the data into subgroups that are, are similar to each other. And of course, we'll have to define what we mean by similar or different to, in order to do the, do the partitioning. And it, um, in a lot of cases, the, in the, w the way we decide to cluster, the way we, we decide on what's similar or different depends on the context. So how does uh, principal components analysis, which we just discussed, uh, how does it contrast with clustering? Well, PCA, as we've seen, looks for a, a, a low-dimensional representation or view of the data that explains a good fraction of the variance, right? So we saw the PCA plots, and we, we, we from it, we derive new variables which could be used for other methods like supervised learning. Um, clustering, on the other hand, looks for homogeneous subgroups of the observations. Okay, so it's not, not looking for variance, but looking, it's looking for similarity among observations. Uh, for example, if we, we're trying, trying to do a segmentation of a market, suppose for um, each of a, a number of customers, we have, we, we, we've, we've measured things like their income, their occupation, how far they live, they live to the closest uh, urban area, and so forth, and we want to, sub, we want to segment them or group them into, into uh, uh, customers that are similar with regard to these features. And why do we want to do that? Because maybe if they're similar with regard to these features, then the, 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 the kind of advertising we use for that subgroup will be uh, important. So we use a certain kind of advertising for one subgroup, like maybe young males who have a lot of money, one subgroup, another subgroup might be... Like me. Like, uh, yeah. Young male. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, an another group may, may be um, uh, housewives who in their 50s who... Um, you know, or their, their children have grown up and they, they're either, they're, they're, they like to travel, for example. So you may want to advertise in a different way to that subgroup. So um, that the task of segmenting that kind of population is, is, is a um, key application of clustering. So we're going to talk about two clustering methods in this section, although there are lots more, as in, in most areas of statistics, there's a, many, many ways of doing things. But the two most important methods, which we'll talk about, are k-means clustering, in which we First, we'll predefine k, the number of clusters, and then we have, we'll, we'll see there's a way of grouping the observations into the k groups. Then, of course, we'll have to define what k is, this number of subgroups, and that's going to be an important and, and hard, difficult choice. And the second method is called hierarchical clustering, which we don't pre-specify the number of clusters k, but rather we do, um, we group the data in all numbers of clusters, and it's done in a hierarchical, agglomerative fashion. And this is nice because we get to see the, the, uh, the clustering for all numbers of, of clusters k. But let's start with the simplest method, k-means clustering. Um, before we describe it, let's, just, let's see an example of, of the result of k-means clustering. So this is some simulated data. Um, and it's been simulated basically in two groups, which are the, the upper group. There's two features, and there's a a group at the top, some space in between, and a group at the bottom. Okay? And now, uh, when we apply k-means clustering, and we have to pre-specify k, again, we'll see the, the, the procedure in a few slides, but when we pre-specify k equals 2, and we run the clustering algorithm, it produces the, the groups indicated by the two colors, blue and gold. Okay? So with k equals 2, it's found a, a, approximately the right clusters. Although you might argue, well, does this point actually belong in the upper cluster rather than the bottom cluster? And that, that's not something which you, you can answer just in a, a quantitative way. That's a, that's a, a subjective call. Um, but in any case, it seems to have found the, the two clusters uh, pretty, pretty correctly. But if I were to have specified k equals 3, it would be forced to find three groups. And the three groups k means clustering found are indicated here by the green, the blue, and the gold. So what it's done is it's broken up this apparently homogeneous cluster into two clusters. Similarly with k equals 4, it finds the blue, the orange, the purple, and the green. Right? So it's, it's broken up this bottom cluster, looks like, into three clusters. Although it's borrowed some points from the top right there. So you can see that the effect of k means clustering, well, first of all, you can see the effect of k is really important. Right? Because if you choose k to be too large, it's going to be forced to, to, uh, to break up groups like this one, which are fairly homogeneous. It's, what's also interesting, Rob, is that variables that are somewhat responsible for clusters, like, for example, the this, this second variable uh -huh. that we have over here, um, also tend to have a high variance. Because, you know, if, if they separate the data in, in, in 
in clusters, they, there tends to be variance. So, so there's some connection between principal components and clustering but in, in, a, in a more abstract sense. Okay, so let's, let's actually drill down into the details of k-means clustering. Well, first of all, we have to define uh, some, some notation for, for, for clusters or sets. So we'll call them c1 through ck, and they're sets of, of, of indices of the observations. So the indices are 1 through n, those are our n observations. Each of these c's is going to be a subset of 1 through n. Okay? And this, this subset is going, to, it's, it's going to be a partition of 1 through n. In other words, if we want to get formalistic, we'll say, well, the c's, their union is 1 through n. So the, if, we, if, we, if we concatenate them all together, they make up 1 through n. So they're a partition of 1 through n, and there's no intersection. So there's no overlap between the clusters. So this is just a fancy way of saying we're going to, we're going to break up the points 1 through n into um, k groups which are non-overlapping and cover the whole set. Okay? And again, if, if the i-th observation is in the k-th cluster, then i will be a member of the indices for group k. Okay. So, again, we, we, we want to somehow find a, a partition C1 through CK, which is a good clustering. Well, what do we mean by good clustering? Well, K means clustering defines good clustering to, to have, to be one in which the within cluster variation is small. Okay? So, let's get back to this picture. If you ask me, well, divide this into, say, two groups, well, the notion that K means is going to use is to say, well, I'm going to find two groups so that within each group, like within the gold, the variation is small within the group, so that the, the points are close together. Similarly, for this group, the points are close together. It's kind of a very intuitive definition. So let's call the within cluster variation of the cluster CK, WCV for within cluster variation of CK. It's the total variation. Okay? For example, we could use squared distance in the two directions. Matter of fact, most of the time we will use squared distance for k-means clustering. So then, well, if we put it all together, if we define the, the, the variation within a cluster to be WCV of CK, we want to find, the, well, the total variation uh, adding up over all clusters is here, and we, we want to find the partitioning C1 through CK to minimize the total within cluster variation. Okay? So we're going to assign the, the end data points to K clusters so that the total within cluster variation summed up over the K clusters is as small as possible. So, yeah, I said this on the previous slide, but here's in detail. Uh, we normally define within cluster variation to be the Euclidean distance, the, the, the pairwise square distance between each pair of observations in the cluster. Okay? Added up over the P feature. So that this is the, 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 the Euclidean or square distance between observations I and I prime. And we sum it up over all I, I prime in the cluster. So, now this is the total pairwise distance of every between every pair in the, in the, in the cluster CK. Okay? And we're going to minimize the total of this over K, the total variation over all clusters. And that's, here it is. So here's our optimization problem now. Here's the within cluster variation. Um, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, find the, the, the clustering C1 through CK that minimizes that. So, um, we have a criterion, but uh, let's actually uh, talk about the k-means algorithm, and then we'll then we'll we'll sort of circle back and, and see why it, it, it minimizes the objective on the previous slide. So how k-means clustering works? Well, it's got the word means in it, so it's going to use a mean somehow. So it's it's actually an alternating algorithm. First of all, we assign uh, to each observation a cluster from one to k. So remember, k is fixed. We have to decide ahead of time. I'm going to pick k equals, for example, two, or k equals three. And we'll worry later about how to choose k, an important value. But let's fix k for the moment. So if each observation is assigned to a cluster run through k, and then we, we have uh, two steps which we alternate back and forth. For each of the k clusters, on the one, one hand, we compute the centroid. That's the average value in, in, for each feature of all the points in the centroid, in the cluster. Okay? So it's, just, it's the mean of, in the vertical and horizontal direction of the points in that, in that cluster. So Having computed the centroids for each of the clusters, on the other step, we, we, do, we, we assign each, each data point to the closest centroid. Okay? And then, having done that, we have uh, a new set of cluster assignments, C1 through ZK. We go back and we compute new centroids. Using the new centroids, we complete new assignments, and we, we alternate back and forth until hopefully this thing settles down, and the solution is the k-means clustering. 
uh, the solution we want is the assignment of points to the to the groups. So let me actually I'm going to show an example. For, well, let's see an example, and then we'll, we'll go back and 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 and, and uh, see why that algorithm actually minimizes the objective that we wrote down. So here's an example. Um, actually, the same example we had before. Uh, here's our data. Okay, again, it's unlabeled data, right? And we've chosen k equals three. So in the first step, we're going to assign uh, points at random to clusters. So we've indicated these by the colors. Okay. And so each point is assigned to, some plus, to, to a different color. And you can see the assignment is, is, is the, the grouping is not very good yet. In other words, we like, we're thinking that this is one group and this is another group, but we don't, we're, not, we're nowhere near that clustering at this point. The first step, we compute the centroids, right? So that these are the, the average of the, in the horizontal and vertical direction of all, of all the points in the gold, green, and blue groups. And the, here the centroids are pretty much on top of each other because the assignment was random, so there's no real grouping yet. But uh, no, don't fear, the k-means clustering will work its way to a good solution. So now we take the centroids and we, um, we find the closest points to each of the centroids. So each point is, we ask, each point, are you closest to the green, the purple, or the orange centroid? And now we color the points accordingly. So this is the partitioning step. So even though those first three centroids were pretty much on top of each other, they right. weren't exactly, and so that hmm. defines a, a fairly nice partition yeah. of the data already. Yeah, it's done a, it's done an almost, well, almost perfect job in terms. Well, you see, we'll, we'll get to the final iterate, and then uh, given this new assignment, we we find the the centroids again. But now the centroids are going to move a lot now, right? Because look where the points are. So, for example, the average of these gold points is way up here. So here's the new gold centroid, new purple, new green. Now the centroids are sitting really right in the middles of the clusters, and the algorithm will now continue and make a few refinements, and here's the final k-means solution in this, for this example. Yeah, very intuitive algorithm. So, let's go back. Remember we had this objective function, which was the total within cluster variation we want to minimize, right? We want to find the partitioning that minimizes this within cluster variation. Well, the question is, have we, does this algorithm that we wrote down, does it achieve that? Well, we can, you can actually see that uh, the algorithm um, will always de decrease the value of the objective at each step. And you might think about why that is. Well, the key to it really is that you, you can write the variation, the pairwise variation, as the vari variation around the, 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 the uh, component-wise means. So, and this is really the key to k-means clustering. Think about it, we, we, we really didn't, we didn't care about the centroids. All we cared about was the clustering. What k-means clustering has done is it's, 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 uh, it's, it's put in the, um, it's changed this to an equivalent expression involving the centroid. And now k-means clustering finds both the component, the, the, the component uh, c1 through ck, as well as the centroid, centroids uh, x bar, and, um, what it does at each step is it minimizes over CK on the one hand or minimizes over the centroid on the other hand. And each of those steps is going to uh, decrease this criterion and hence decrease this criterion. Okay. So if you have centroids, yeah. then when you, when you mm. come to a, uh, update the assignment of each mm. point, yeah. it's going to go to the, the, the group for which this distance is smallest, for fixed centroids. And on the other hand, if, if all the assignments are fixed, we know that the sample mean is minimizes the sum of squares. And so that's why each of those steps necessarily makes the criterion go down. So this is, this is very slick. We started off with the problem involving one set of variables. We made it, we added another set of variables, which we think it make it harder, but it actually makes it easier, right? Because now, because when we do the joint optimization over both sets of variables, we get to the answer for the, for the ones we care about, the, the clustering. So that's just the detail of the previous figure, which we talked about. Now, oh, sorry, I missed a point here, which is that it's not, this algorithm, although it gives you a, a local minimum, it's not guaranteed to give a global minimum. Why not? Well, what does that mean, Rob, a local minimum? Oh, local minimum means that, um, well, the point is, is that there could, you could start the algorithm from, okay, okay, the local minimum, I guess, means in calculus, it means that the, the derivative of the function is zero, okay? But it doesn't mean that it's the, the lowest point of the function. So if a function is not convex, you can have a place where the 
where the derivative, or there's a valley, which is flat, but it's not the lowest value in the whole function. Okay? So this algorithm will get to a local minimum, will get to a place, get to a valley of the, of the, the function we're trying to minimize, but it won't be the lowest value necessarily. So we can think of this, this function that we're trying to optimize as being like a, a big valley, right. but it's got lots of little sub-valleys or little ponds or whatever, and you know, any minimum is one of those, and we can get stuck in one of those. Right, so in the optimization world, the idea, the idea of a convex function, which is basically there's only one valley. So if you find a minimum, it's a global minimum. But this function is not convex. In other words, it can go up and down and have more than one valley. And the k-means algorithm will, will land you in a valley, but not necessarily the lowest valley, because the function is not convex. So actually, here's an example. If this is for the same did, here's an example where we start the algorithm from six different starting configurations. Remember, our starting configuration was we assigned each point at random to one of the clusters. And this is actually a good thing to do with k-means clustering, is since we're not guaranteed to get the global minimum, we start the algorithm at more than one place, and we just examine the value of the criterion at the end of at the end in each case. Remember, starting yeah. the algorithm was this random assignment of points to to the number of clusters you're using. All right. So when we start the algorithm from different places, we get actually quite different solutions. Don't worry about the fact that the colors are chosen differently. Like these, these are gold and these are green. That the coloring is arbitrary, but the the partitioning is quite different. Um, and we. Typically, we pick the lowest value. There's, let's see, this guy. Well, these looks like we got three different solutions there. Three or four right. different, three different. Yeah, three different solutions, right? I guess the one, the ones who colored yeah. in red at the top all have exactly the same distance. It, yeah, and so they are actually all the same. The colorings are different, but as Rob said, the yeah. colorings are arbitrary. Yeah. So the, 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 these solutions, these four panels, give us the the solution with lowest. But the, but the lowest top left and the bottom right are actually different solutions again. Right. Okay, so uh, that's k-means clustering. We'll, we'll actually talk a little bit about the end, uh, how to choose k, which will also be a, uh, an issue for hierarchical clustering, which is a topic of our next, our next segment.